Well, hello, and good evening. Hey, Prody, you made it just in time. Nice one. I am Sam, and you, that's here, are listening to Geliteracy. Hello, welcome. Um, I am once again extremely tired today. I don't know why. It sort of eased up a little bit, and then this evening, like an hour ago, I just had to shut my eyes for a nap and hope that I would wake up in time before the stream, because I didn't believe in setting a timer. Um, but, yeah. I'm I'm here, you're here, so let's have some stories in a bit. Sort of a little out of breath from walking from the bus. Ah, I know that feeling. Um, yeah, and we've and we've had some resubs, so I'll get to those first of all in reverse order. Lady Mephistopheles, good time zone. Thank you for the twenty months. You don't have the spoons today to focus properly, but you must ensure that you get your well-deserved Bezos dollars by pressing the button. Well, thank you very much for pressing the button. Thank you for the money. You, not Jeff Bezos. You, thank you, thank you for the for the for the subscription. It's much appreciated. Um, Thunder, you think the month counter might be broken because you already had one for June and it's not July yet? But either way, yay! Yeah, Twitch does some odd things with months. I'm not sure whether it counts it on like. I don't think it does it by calendar month. I think it might just be every four weeks. Um, maybe I'm not sure and. Also, because it starts counting from one, so yeah, it, it it does some odd stuff. But thank you, it's lovely to see you. I hope you will. And see so you debating nine p.m. is too late to do some baking. I I would personally, if I if I had to drive to go and bake something at nine p.m. and it wasn't going to disturb anyone else around in the house, let her rip, go for it. And uh, Andy Pants, uh, twenty-two months. Thank you very much. Insert clever pun here. Um, so I read actually a funny thing about that earlier, just the other day, that um, I think it was like a study published by, I want to say Harvard, but for all I know it could be MIT, that actually apparently no pun is funny or clever. So there we go. Um, but yeah, how are we doing? Welcome in. Um, you're looking at the games on Steam, probably going to be responsible and not going to buy. I have been doing that and kind of capitulated a little bit this afternoon. It what what broke the dam? You will not stand for this pun slander. Well, tough. Um, you can sit down for it. Oh, Joey has collapsed onto the floor. Okay, he is fine. Um. Yes. What was I saying? Steam. Steam games. Yeah. I so <laughs> sitting quite comfortably for it. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I I have been I've been browsing the Steam sale, and I I do sort of I do two things looking at the two different price brackets of like how how many things kind of how there's because I've got a lot of stuff on my wish list, and I'm probably not going to buy. Hey, Sarah, hello. Um, weirdly, that's highlighted by Twitch as a first time chat, but hello, well, welcome to the channel, first time chatter, Sarah Surinde, Surinde. I don't know where you want the emphasis. Uh, welcome in. It's migraine day, so you have something you can enjoy that staring at the screen. Oh no, that sucks. I'm sorry that that's, you know, I'm sorry that those are the circumstances by which you're here, but yeah, okay. Um, I hope the migraine... Hello, stranger, indeed. Welcome. Um, yeah, I hope the migraine eases up and leaves you alone. I'm sorry, that sucks. Um, yeah, Steam, I, I look at, like, the, the, kind of the two different price brackets of super cheap stuff that I've had on my wish list for years and is now down to, like, 90% off and kind of like, okay, well if I spent 10 quid, how many different games can I just bulk up my Steam library with? Not that it le not that it needs it for under 10 quid. And then at the higher end, like what what's what's kind of a pretty good discount that could be like the next game that I get into in some way. Um, and I, I ended up, I've picked up Riven um as in the the recently released remake um because i like lucy and i are very much into like that and mist and other sort of puzzly games and generally one of us plays it and streams it to the other um and so i i've picked up that for us to do together and i also picked up an other game that i'm not going to say yet because I realise it would probably make a very good one to stream over on Longest John's Gaming on the 4th of July. Which probably sounds like it's going to be one thing, and it's not, because that's, that's election day here in the UK, and I thought that if I feel up to it, I might try and do a stream on the evening of the election when the results are coming in. 
and I, I may have a game that that sort of suits that in some way that might be quite quite interesting. Kind of. At a, at a tangent. So, yeah. Um, looking forward to that. And obviously being me, now that, now that that dam has broken, I am going to go back to Steam and look for more things and I really want, I really want to get Animal Well. Animal Well looks really good. And I've been trying to avoid as many spoilers about it as possible. So I really want that. And there, there's oh, there's so many things. Um, my game's mild as things go. Okay, well that's that's something. Yeah, that's a relief in, in some way. Um, it's all Celeste. It's two bucks. You've been thinking of why you should get that, and at that price you can't say no. It's completely fair. Yeah, Celeste is like Celeste. I think is one of the first what I would consider to be hard games that I that I went into and played when when I sort of. I think I was talking about this on when um, I think it was like Shadow at Noon in chat the other day when I was streaming Elden Ring. Um, but like that, there, there was there was like a, a period, like a point in my life where I just like, yeah, there was a turning point in my life. No, I for well with Sarah here, yeah. Those of you familiar with like Loading Ready Run and folks from there, it was Adam from there watching him stream. Um, on stream, I talked about him spending a long time trying to defeat Radan in Elden Ring with whips and eventually doing it but before that it was watching him stream um, I want to be the Boshi and there is a boss in the middle of that game that again is was for him just a tremendous roadblock and like it, it took many streams of many hours just relentlessly like attempting that boss and getting past it and sort of seeing seeing all that effort and that sort of relief at when it eventually broke that that was for me sort of a little bit of an inspiring like maybe I don't want to be like the ultimate hard gamer kind of person that's that's not for me but maybe I should try pushing myself a little bit and I don't know maybe it's fun to actually attempt things that are above me as a challenge and try to you know, try to improve and, but you know, yeah, push myself a little bit in video games, of course, not in anything functional or useful in real life. Um, and I think it was after that, like Celeste was one of the first games I looked at, and I think I, I think I got it on Epic for free, maybe, or it was on Game Pass. And also, I okay, I'll, I was going to like try and finish the point, and I realised no, I'm rambling, so I'm, I'll stop. Ray Tracer. Thank you very much for the 27 months. Good time zone. You brought home two massive books and a dozen cupcakes from the library today. Hell yeah, that's living. Nice one. Good job. Um, I have my quite sizable copy of the Southern Reach trilogy sat behind me, which I'm looking forward still to getting into and through. Uh, are they the ones who do the charity stream? Yes, Loading Ready Run are the ones that do Desert Bus. Um, yeah, and so he's he, the guy I'm talking about doesn't actually participate in Desert Bus, but he is he's part of the part of the group. Um, and so yeah, it was it was watching him um, do um, I want to be the Boshi and just like push himself through that absurd challenge. And before anyone even thinks of suggesting it, no. Um, but yeah, that, that's where I was like, okay, well. Celeste has a reputation as a really difficult platformer, but also an excellent platformer, so yeah, why not? I'll give it a go. And I've not 100%ed it, because again, you know, <laughs> do what you enjoy, not past the point. Um, and yeah, that, that was one I was like, okay, I, I reckon I'll give this a shot. I probably won't defeat it. It's probably going to defeat me, but yeah, I actually managed to finish it, and one of those sort of first proud accomplishments of like, yeah, I actually, I set myself a challenge and I rose to it. Nice. So yeah, I I recommend Celeste. It's a good game. Um, well, there you go. That's that's ramble over. We 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 did it. We got there. Yay. Um, I'm so I'm so like anxious when Joey is just lying on the floor directly behind my chair, that he doesn't realise how absent-minded I can be, and I. Do not want to scoot the chair back and like pinch him at all. Um, you spent enough time playing and enjoying old platforms, but you've never actually played a modern one. And you understand Celeste is supposed to be one of the best. Yeah, it is. It's it's very very good. Um, 
like I, I feel like it does an excellent job of like training you and leading you and like you know the 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 good game design stuff of like introduce a new mechanic give you kind of a safe place to sort of practice it and sort of get get the feel for it and then just ramp up the difficulty a little bit add a bit more challenge add some time constraints but not just straight away like ha ha we made it difficult you fail but actually just like walking you through the challenge and just escalating things a little bit and then at the end you're like damn i got good like yeah you did well done nice one um so I hope school reference also very much means it to be a very good thing. You're watching ghosts and you have spent ages trying to work out who the guy who plays Humphrey reminds you of. It's me. I haven't seen ghosts on that. I don't know who that character is. So, you know, for now. <laughs> I was gonna say for now, I'm not insulted by it. No, I'm not gonna be insulted by it. Uh, but um nice, okay. Yeah, I I I laugh because I yeah, I I do that thing a lot as well. The sort of like I'll see someone like no, I've I've seen this person, but who is the, who is this person? Who are you? And that's where I go and look up their IMDb page to see if I've seen them in a film before. And half the time I haven't, and then I realise they just really strongly remind me of someone else. Um, yeah, I I know it. I do it. Um, oh, what, do you, do you want to go out now, Mister Cat? Hey. Yes. Okay. And we return from our distraction. The voices and the way we word things can be very similar. Oh, okay. Keep an eye on my disembodied head. Um, yes, will do. Good. Okay, right. So we have two stories tonight. And I don't, I don't expect it to be as... I know the last few have been promises a little bit shorter than usual. And then they're kind of coming around the same time. And I feel like this might be another one of the same, where I have two stories tonight. One that is extremely short, and I was just going to do it at the end of the last one, and then didn't. And one that is a bit longer, and will take up the rest of the stream with a break in the middle. So, what I'll probably do is start the short one first in a second. Um, I mean, if, really, if, annoyingly, it feels like it's a good one to finish on, but then I have to, like calculate instead where to take the break and the break sort of came at kind of a nice place so let's just see let's just see maybe uh, one, four, five. Five, it would be uh, don't don't mind the silence I'm just doing some extremely rudimentary maths um, oh, I could move I could move the break to there could move the break to there I think that might work actually uh, good long ramble that let you change clothes and settle down much appreciated no worries um, yeah let's let's change things around a little bit let's uh, take Depeche Mode advice and enjoy the silence. Sorry. Depeche Mode's advice and enjoy the silence. Okay. There. Well, we're, that's fine. We're getting all the tongue twisters out of the way first. And then... And then, yeah. I'll be all fine and good for the reading. So. Change of plans. Change of order. It's... I, I, yes, I know. I figured it's a song. I know it's, it's Depeche... I, I probably know the song. Um, but I don't know a lot of Depeche Mode songs by name. Um, but I know, that, yes, I know who they are. Good grief. I'm 41. I know who Depeche Mode are. Right. This. Um, this is, excuse a very loud clacks of the keyboard, by the way. Um, this is the first story that I should be reading tonight. It is called The Listener. That's how that word's pronounced. It's by, as both stories tonight are, it's by Algernon Blackwood. <laughs> yes, I know sounds so disappointed, so defensive. Yes, exactly. Put you in your place. Um, 
yeah, this is this is a, a short story by Algernon Blackwood. I'm going to do a little bit of introducing. First of all, um, the most important one here is a bit of a, a little bit of a content warning for like um, self harm slash suicide as a as a topic that will come up. Not not handled in the the most sort of respectful modern way. So a bit of kind of old timey attitudes towards that. Um, just like ripping that band-aid off early and just putting that out there in case that's a thing that you want to be wary of or mindful of for yourself um so yeah please be advised on that and as i say look after yourselves uh second thing i noticed while i was reading and i think i've complained about it before um okay as always thank you for the warning no worries thunder you're welcome um should it even actually be? It should be. Should at least be. I think safe. Well, hang on. Oh yeah, because I just changed where I put the break. Um, that's going to confuse me when I come to the wrong one. So let's scribble that out. Um, I was going to say what. Well, yeah, he might be safe to the break. I'm not sure. It's yeah. As I say, it's 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 not like I I don't feel like it's particularly heavy with it. Um, but it is kind of a, you know, without spoiling too much, sort of a core theme that comes up. Um, uh, what's, sorry, you haven't actually heard Depeche, oh, Depeche much of the city since you think you like them? Yeah, you might do, yeah. Um, it's not silly, there's, there's a lot of music out and about, to be honest, and frankly more happening all the time. Um, the second thing, yeah, I noticed while I was reading through that my copy here has a number of weird typos in it. And weird by which I mean it very much seems like I'm reading a copy that has been scanned from another copy and just not as in like a typo where you try to type a word and hit the wrong keys but literally it is a different word that to a scanner could look like the same word and hasn't had any thought behind that word doesn't make any sense and like the the, the clue that sort of tipped me off really was um, like the word up was often being rewritten as tip because T and I next to each other can kind of, or like a U can kind of look like a T and an I next to you. Uh, next to you, next to each other. Good gr oh, okay. Why do typos suddenly appear every time? Anyway. Um, yeah, uh, a U can apparently in the text that this was scanned from look a little bit like a T and an I next to each other and so this will at times have the word tip instead of up and other such examples and I checked it against the text that I've linked there in chat and the text that I've linked there in chat seems to be accurate and correct which is where I was able to verify that this seems like a who is the publisher? Um, it is a digireads.com book, digireads.com publishing. Um, so I guess there's your answer. Copyright, digireads.com. Um, I have an ISBN if you would like it. I can actually put that in chat if you want to look it up. Uh, one dash four two zero nine dash three three seven seven dash nine there you go you can now steal this book's um credit card details yeah like the, and and like on it we're not getting to the story sorry on, on like the i guess a general note i feel like that's a thing particularly i have found by trying to source like cheaper copies of of old old stories that are in the public domain that there's a number of publishers out there who very clearly seem to have just set up like a a quick and dirty publishing house to without real thought or effort scan or control a control c control v publish copies of books um that are in the public domain so you're not necessarily doing anything wrong but you are selling kind of a in some cases just a cheap, in other cases very poorly formatted or spell checked copy of a book. Um, exactly what this is, scoop up public domain stuff and put it in e-format and cheap physical copies for an easy buck. Yeah, and like, that's that's not, 
it's not the worst offense. Like I, I much prefer reading from a physical copy than from, um, from from off a screen. And so for for the effort of spending three, four, five pounds, or whatever, to get a cheap physical copy of a book or of a collection or something like that, that's not too bad. But it is a little bit obnoxious when it becomes obvious to you, the reader, that they've put in no effort at all to proofread anything that they're putting out and also in this one yeah some of the like the formatting is largely fine until you start getting to sections of speech when again like clearly microsoft word was having a little bit of a meltdown with some of this and so yeah it's it's fine for this but none <laughs> some of these i wouldn't recommend um, and it's just disappointing that there's not really an easy way to see that before um, before you purchase it. Um, it's like the the other Algernon Blackwood collection that I've got. That 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 one is more egregious because it uses literally just like a really poorly compressed JPEG of like the Penguin collection or something. Like they literally just took a picture of someone else's cover and stuck it on the front of theirs with a massively down res JPEG and it's it's like I think I think I've mentioned this to Lucy on a stream before in the past where I was like we could probably do a better version better like better effort than this should we do should we do this it's like collect up the stuff that we've read and not just low effort copy paste stick them out but actually you know do a bit of text ourselves, chill literacy editions. Yeah, like we've talked about it before. Um, like bundle them up in some form. We probably it would probably have to be Amazon print on demand. Um, yeah, like with with some annotations or just like introductions by us and stuff like that. And I don't know, it it, it might be a cool thing to do. Um, if it's I don't know, yeah maybe if it's something people would be interested in. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe. Might be nice because again, it's just people, I thought like clearly people are doing some real low effort versions. Um, what what could we do that would also be low effort, but a little bit above that effort so that it's worthwhile to you? Um, no, <laughs> could have them signed by Joey. Oh, a little a little paw print in there would be adorable. Yeah, um, there was a point last year I was like, wait. Lucy, you must know about book binding. That seems like something you would know. Yes, it is. Right. What if, not for like for commercial use yet, but what if like we found some of these texts online that are, this is when I was having a hard time finding some things that I wanted to read in physical copies and the only thing available was like an online edition. And I was like, why, how, how much effort would it take? More than, more than you would think, of course, to actually like make some physical copies of books to read from on stream because that frankly would be kind of cool and then we'd have like a like as like a bit of a hobby like you'd have a cool physical product or f object at the end that hey, if you wanted you could sell or stick on the shelf and it would look neat so yeah we've we've talked about ideas like that before and maybe maybe we should revisit them in some form who knows um anyway we're not going to get anywhere if i don't actually start reading a story so because joey's going to be back in like three minutes to interrupt so yeah this this first story as i said content warnings for the the subject of of suicide will come up um so you know be be on your advice be be on be on be advised be on your be on your lookout for that if that is something um absolutely adore the videos of people bookbinding fanfics you wish it's something you could do uh, but you can't yeah that's fair like well again it's it's for me it's that sort of realization of Oh wait, people people can do this by hand. There, there's there's a part of my brain that I'll look at like art sometimes, and my brain just goes, clearly a person can't do this. That's far too like impressive and cool and detailed, not to like downplay art that people can do. But it just like it just crosses over a line in my head that goes like, no, people can't do that, surely. And then you see a like, good artist and like, oh yes, no, you can absolutely do that. And there's just other things as well, like, you know, again, like a, a nice hardback book. It's like, well, it's obviously been made by a machine. A person can't do that. The, the skill has to come from a person first of all, and then you teach the machine how to do it. So it's like, oh, wait, yeah, obviously people bind books by hand. That's 
that's how you make books. I wonder how you do that. And yeah. Um, definitely some fixes. Love to have physical copies of. Neat. Yeah, it's all magic. I agree. Anyway, right. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna. I need to read you people a story. That's what you came here for. Not this. This. We'll. We'll. We'll talk about this on a Monday sometime. Excuse the loud water slurps. I saw that light up the mic. Right. Let's go. Let's do a story. Thank you all for being patient. So without any further rambling, <laughs> stop, without any further rambling, um, let's have a story. This is The Listener by Algernon Blackwood. September 4th. I have hunted all over London for rooms suited to my income, £120 a year, and have at last found them. Two rooms, without modern conveniences, it is true, and in an old ramshackle building, but within a stone's throw of P Place, and in an eminently respectable street. The rent is only twenty-five pounds a year. I had begun to despair when at last I found them by chance. The chance was a mere chance and unworthy of record. I had to sign a lease for a year, and I did so willingly. The furniture from our old place in Hampshire, which has been stored so long, will just suit them. October 1st. Here I am in my two rooms in the centre of London, and not far from the offices of the periodicals where I occasionally, so where occasionally I dispose of an article or two. The building is at the end of a cul-de-sac. The alley is well paved and clean, and lined chiefly with the backs of sedate and institutional-looking buildings. There is a stable in it. My own house is dignified with the title of Chambers. I feel as if one day the honour must prove too much for it, and it will swell with pride and fall asunder. It is very old. The floor of my sitting-room has valleys and low hills on it, and the top of the door slants away from the ceiling with a glorious disregard of what is usual. They must have quarrelled fifty years ago, and have been going apart ever since. October 2nd. My landlady is old and thin, with a faded, dusty face. She is uncommunicative. The few words she utters seem to cost her pain. Probably her lungs are half choked with dust. She keeps my rooms as free from this commodity as possible and has the assistance of a strong girl who brings up the breakfast and lights the fire. As I have already said, she is not communicative. In reply to pleasant efforts on my part, she informed me briefly that I was the only occupant of the house at present. My rooms had not been occupied for some years. There had been other gentlemen upstairs, but they had left. She never looks straight at me when she speaks, but fixes her dim eyes on my middle waistcoat button till I get nervous and begin to think it isn't on straight or is the wrong sort of button altogether. October 8th. My week's book is nicely kept and so far is reasonable. Milk and sugar, sevenpence. Bread, sixpence. Butter, eightpence. Marmalade, sixpence. Eggs, one shilling, eight pence. Laundress, two shillings, nine pence. Oil, six pence. Attendance, five shillings. Total, twelve shillings, two pence. The landlady has a son who, she told me, is something on a homnibus. He comes occasionally to see her. I think he drinks, for he talks very loud, regardless of the hour of the day or night, and tumbles about over the furniture downstairs. All the morning I sit indoors, writing. Articles, verses for the comic papers, a novel I have been at for three years, and concerning which I have dreams, a children's book in which the imagination has free reign, and another book which is to last as long as myself, since it is an honest record of my soul's advance or retreat in the struggle of life. Besides these, I keep a book of poems, which I use as a safety valve, and concerning which I have no dreams whatsoever. Between the lot I am always occupied. 
In the afternoons, I generally try to take a walk for my health's sake through Regent's Park into Kensington Gardens or farther afield to Hampstead Heath. October 10th. Everything went wrong today. I have two eggs for breakfast. This morning, one of them was bad. I rang the bell for Emily. When she came in, I was reading the paper and, without looking up, I said, Eggs bad. Oh, is it, sir? She said. Oh, get another one. And went out, taking the egg with her. I waited my breakfast for her return, which was in five minutes. She put the new egg on the table and went away. But when I looked down, I saw that she had taken away the good egg and left the bad one, all green and yellow, in the slop basin. I rang again. You've taken the wrong egg, I said. Oh, she exclaimed. I thought the one I took down didn't smell so very bad. In due time, she returned with the good egg and I resumed my breakfast with two eggs, but less appetite. It was all very trivial, to be sure, but so stupid that I felt annoyed. The character of that egg influenced everything I did. I wrote a bad article and tore it up. I got a bad headache. I used bad words to myself. Everything was bad, so I chucked work and went for a long walk. I dined at a cheap chop house on my way back and reached home about nine o'clock. Rain was just beginning to fall as I came in and the wind was rising. It promised an ugly night. The alley looked dismal and dreary and the hall of the house as I passed through it felt chilly as a tomb. It was the first stormy night I had experienced in my new quarters. The draughts were awful. They came criss-cross, met in the middle of the room, and formed eddies and whirlpools and cold, silent currents that almost lifted the hair of my head. I stuffed up the sashes of the windows with neckties and odd socks, and sat over the smoky fire to keep warm. First I tried to write, but found it too cold. My hand turned to ice on the paper. What tricks the wind did play with the old place. It came rushing up the forsaken alley with the sound like the feet of a hurrying crowd of people who stopped suddenly at the door. I felt as if a lot of curious folk had arranged themselves just outside and were staring up at my windows. Then they took to their heels again and fled, whispering and laughing down the lane, only, however, to return with the next gust of wind and repeat their impertinence. On the other side of my room, a single square window opens into a sort of shaft or well that measures about six feet across to the back wall of another house. Down this funnel, the wind dropped and puffed and shouted. Such noises I had never heard before. Between these two entertainments, I sat over the fire in a greatcoat, listening to the deep booming in the chimney. It was like being in a ship at sea and I almost looked for the floor to rise in undulations and rock to and fro. October 12th I wish I were not quite so lonely and so poor, and yet I love both my loneliness and my poverty. The former makes me appreciate the companionship of the wind and rain, while the latter preserves my liver and prevents me wasting time in dancing attendance upon women. Poor, ill-dressed men are not acceptable attendants. My parents are dead, and my only sister is, no, not dead exactly, but married to a very rich man. They travel most of the time, he to find his health, she to lose herself. Through sheer neglect on her part, she has long passed out of my life, the door closed when, after an absolute silence of five years, she sent me a cheque for fifty pounds at Christmas. It was signed by her husband. I returned it to her in a thousand pieces and in an unstamped envelope, so at least I had the satisfaction of knowing that it cost her something. She wrote back, with a broad quill pen that covered a whole page with three lines. You are evidently as cracked as ever, and rude and ungrateful into the bargain. It had always been my special terror lest the insanity of my father's family should leap across the generations and appear in me. 
This thought haunted me, and she knew it. So after this little exchange of civilities, the door slammed never to open again. I heard the crash it made, and, with it, the falling from the walls of my heart of many little bits of china with their own peculiar value. Rare china, some of it, that only needed dusting. The same walls, too, carried mirrors, in which I used sometimes to see reflected the misty lawns of childhood, the daisy chains, the wind-torn blossoms scattered through the orchard by warm rains, the robber's cave in the long walk, and the hidden store of apples in the hayloft. <clears throat> she was my inseparable companion then. But when the door slammed, the mirrors cracked across their entire length, and the visions they held vanished forever. Now I am quite alone. At forty, one, not can, so one cannot begin all over again to build up careful friendships, and all others are comparatively worthless. <clears throat> October 14th. My bedroom is ten by ten. It is below the level of the front room, and a step leads down into it. Both rooms are very quiet on calm nights, for there is no traffic down this forsaken alleyway. In spite of the occasional larks of the wind, it is a most sheltered strip. At its upper end, below my windows, all the cats of the neighbourhood congregate as soon as darkness gathers. They lie undisturbed on the long ledge of a blind window of the opposite building, for after the postman has come and gone at 9.30, no footsteps ever dare to interrupt their sinister conclave. <coughs> Excuse me. No step but my own, or sometimes the unsteady footfall of the son who is something on a homnibus. October 15th. I dined at an ABC shop on poached eggs and coffee, and then went for a stroll around the outer edge of Regent's Park. It was ten o'clock when I got home. I counted no less than thirteen cats, all of a dark colour, crouching under the lee side of the alley walls. It was a cold night, and the stars shone like points of ice in a blue-black sky. The cats turned their heads and stared at me in silence as I passed. An odd sensation of shyness took possession of me under the glare of so many pairs of unblinking eyes. As I fumbled with the latch key, they jumped noiselessly down and pressed against my legs, as if anxious to be let in. But I slammed the door in their faces and ran quickly upstairs. The front room, as I entered to grope for the matches, felt as cold as a stone vault, and the air held an unusual dampness. October 17th. For several days, I have been working on a ponderous article that allows no play for the fancy. My imagination requires a judicious rein. I am afraid to let it loose, for it carries me sometimes into appalling places beyond the stars and beneath the world. No one realises the danger more than I do. But what a foolish thing to write here, for there is no one to know, no one to realise. My mind, of late, has held unusual thoughts, thoughts I have never had before, about medicines and drugs and the treatment of strange illnesses. I cannot imagine their source. At no time in my life have I dwelt upon such ideas as now constantly throng my brain. I have had no exercise lately, for the weather has been shocking, and all my afternoons have been spent in the reading room of the British Museum where I have a reader's ticket. I have made an unpleasant discovery. There are rats in the house. At night, from my bed, I have heard them scampering across the hills and valleys of the front room, and my sleep has been a good deal disturbed in consequence. October 19th. The landlady, I find, has a little boy with her, probably her son's child. In fine weather, he plays in the alley and draws a wooden cart over the cobbles. One of the wheels is off, and it makes a most distracting noise. After putting up with it as long as possible, I found it was getting on my nerves, and I could not write. So I rang the bell. Emily answered it. Emily, will you ask the little fellow to make less noise? It's impossible to work. 
The girl went downstairs, and soon afterwards the child was called in by the kitchen door. I felt rather a brute for spoiling his play. In a few minutes, however, the noise began again, and I felt that he was the brute. He dragged the broken toy with a string over the stones till the rattling noise jarred every nerve in my body. It became unbearable, and I rang the bell a second time. The noise must be put a stop to, I said to the girl with decision. Yes, sir, she grinned. I know, but one of the wheels is off. The men in the stable offered to mend it for him, but he wouldn't let him. He says he likes it that way. I can't help what he likes. The noise must stop. I can't write. Yes, sir. I'll tell Mrs. Monson. The noise stopped for the day, then. October 23rd. Every day, for the past week, that cart has rattled over the stones till I have come to think of it as a huge carrier's van with four wheels and two horses, and every morning I have been obliged to ring the bell and have it stopped. The last time Mrs. Monson herself came up and said she was sorry I had been annoyed, the sounds should not occur again. With rare discursiveness she went on to ask if I was comfortable and how I liked the rooms. I replied cautiously. I mentioned the rats. She said they were mice. I spoke of the draughts. She said, yes, it were a draughty house. I referred to the cats, and she said they had been as long as she could remember. By way of conclusion, she informed me that the house was over two hundred years old, and that the last gentleman who had occupied my rooms was a painter who had real jimmy buoys and raffles hanging all over the walls. It took me some moments to discern that Chimabwe and Raphael were in the woman's mind. October 24th. Last night, the son, who is something on a homnibus, came in. He had evidently been drinking, for I heard loud and angry voices below in the kitchen long after I had gone to bed. Once, too, I caught, a singular, caught the singular words rising up to me through the floor. Burn it from top to bottom is the only thing that will ever make this house right. I knocked on the floor and the voices ceased suddenly, though later I again heard their clamour in my dreams. These rooms are very quiet, almost too quiet sometimes. On windless nights they are silent as the grave, and the house might be miles in the country. The roar of London's traffic reaches me only in heavy, distant vibrations. It holds an ominous note sometimes, like that of an approaching army, or an immense tidal wave very far away thundering in the night. October 27th Mrs. Monson though admirably silent, is a foolish, fussy woman. She does such stupid things. In dusting the room, she puts all my things in the wrong places. The ashtrays, which should be on the writing table, she sets in a silly row on the mantelpiece. The pen tray, which should be beside the inkstand, she hides away cleverly among the books on my reading desk. My gloves she arranges daily in idiot in an idiotic array upon a half-filled bookshelf, and I always have to rearrange them on the low table by the door. She places my armchair at impossible angles between the fire and the light and the tablecloth, the one with the Trinity Hall stains, she puts on the table in such a fashion that when I look at it, I feel as if my tie and all my clothes were on crooked and awry. She exasperates me. Her very silence and meekness are irritating. Sometimes I feel inclined to throw the inkstand at her, just to bring an expression to her watery eyes and a squeak from those colourless lips. <sighs> Dear me, what violent expressions I am making use of. How very foolish of me. And, and yet it almost seems as if the words were not my own, but had been spoken into my ear. I mean, I never make use of such terms, naturally. October 30th. I have been here a month. The place does not agree with me, I think. My headaches are more frequent and violent, and my nerves are a perpetual source of discomfort and annoyance. I have conceived a great dislike for Mrs. Monson, a feeling I am certain she reciprocates. Somehow the impression comes frequently to me that there are 
goings-on in this house, of which I know nothing, and which she is careful to hide from me. Last night her son slept in the house, and this morning as I was standing at the window I saw him go out. He glanced up and caught my eye. It was a loutish figure, and a singularly repulsive face that I saw, and he gave me the benefit of a very unpleasant leer. At least, so I imagined. Evidently, I am guessing absurdly sensitive to trifles, and I suppose it is my disordered nerves making themselves felt. In the British Museum this afternoon I noticed several people at the reader's table staring at me and watching every movement I made. Whenever I looked up from my books I found their eyes upon me. It seemed to me unnecessary and unpleasant, and I left earlier than was my custom. When I reached the door I threw back at last so I threw back a last look into the room and saw every head at the table turned in my direction. It annoyed me very much, and yet I know it is foolish to take note of such things. When I am well, they pass me by. I must get more regular exercise. Of late, I have had next to none. November 2nd. The utter stillness of this house is beginning to oppress me. I wish there were other fellows living upstairs. No footsteps ever sound overhead, and no tread ever passes my door to go up the next flight of stairs. I am beginning to feel some curiosity to go up myself and see what the upper rooms are like. I feel lonely here and isolated, swept into a deserted corner of the world, and forgotten. Once I actually caught myself gazing into the long, cracked mirrors, trying to see the sunlight dancing beneath the trees in the orchard but only deep shadows seemed to, con seemed to congregate there now, and I soon desisted. It has been very dark all day, with no wind stirring. The fogs have begun. I had to use a reading lamp all this morning. There was no cart to be heard today. I actually missed it. This morning, in the gloom and silence, I think I could have almost welcomed it. After all, the sound is a very human one, and this empty house at the end of the alley holds other noises that are not quite so satisfactory. I have never once seen a policeman in the lane, and the postmen always hurry out with no evidence of a desire to loiter. 10 p.m. As I write this, I hear no sound but the deep murmur of the distant traffic and the low sighing of the wind. The two sounds melt into one another. Now and again a cat raises its shrill, uncanny cry upon the darkness. The cats are always there under my windows when the darkness falls. The wind is dropping into the funnel with a noise like the sudden sweeping of immense, distant wings. It is a dreary night. I feel lost and forgotten. November 3rd from my windows I can see arrivals. When anyone comes to the door I can just see the hat and shoulders and the hand on the bell. Only two fellows have been to see me since I came here two months ago. Both of them I saw from the window before they came up and heard their voices asking if I was in. Neither of them ever came back. I have finished the ponderous article. On reading it through, however, I was dissatisfied with it, and drew my pencil through almost every page. There were strange expressions and ideas in it that I could not explain, and viewed with amazement, not to say alarm. They did not sound like my very own, and I could not remember having written them. Can it be that my memory is beginning to be affected? My pens are never to be found. That stupid old woman puts them in a different place each day. I must give her due credit for finding so many new hiding places. Such ingenuity is wonderful. I have told her repeatedly, but she always says, I'll speak to Emily, sir. Emily always says, I'll tell Mrs. Monson, sir. Their foolishness makes me irritable and scatters all my thoughts. I should like to stick the lost pens into them and turn them out, blind-eyed to be scratched and mauled by those thousand hungry cats. What a ghastly thought. Where in the world did it come from? 
such an idea is no more my own than it is the policeman's, yet I, I felt I had to write it. It was, it was like a voice singing in my head, and my pen wouldn't stop till the last word was finished. <laughs> what ridiculous nonsense. I must, and will, restrain myself. I must take more regular exercise. My nerves and liver plague me horribly. November 4th. I attended a curious lecture in the French Quarter on death, but the room was so hot and I was so weary that I fell asleep. The only part I heard, however, touched my imagination vividly. Speaking of suicides, the lecturer said that self-murder was no escape from the miseries of the present, but only a preparation of greater sorrow for the future. Suicides, he declared, cannot shirk their responsibilities so easily. They must return to take up life exactly where they laid it so violently down, but with the added pain and punishment of their weakness. Many of them wander the earth in unspeakable misery till they can reclothe themselves in the body of someone else, generally a lunatic or weak-minded person who cannot resist the hideous obsession. This is their only means of escape. Surely a weird and horrible idea. I wish I had slept all the time and not heard it at all. My mind is morbid enough without such ghastly fancies. Such mischievous propaganda should be stopped by the police. I'll write to the Times and suggest it. Good idea. One second, Joey was howling at the door. In you come. Wow. Cat break. Are you gonna, where are you going to go? Do you, want, do you want to jump up? It's warm in here. You're not going to like it. Where do you want to go? Yeah. Right. Sneak here. He has been scooped. He is on my lap. Right, let's carry on. Let's find where we were. There. We? Okay, goodbye. Didn't think that would last. Right, let's carry on. Wow. Let's not carry on. What are we gonna what are we singing about? What? I'm going to read. You were just on my lap. No, you, you can sit there and think about it. I walked home through Greek Street, Soho, and imagined that a hundred years had slipped back into place, and De Quincey was still there, haunting the night with invocations to his just subtle and mighty drug. His vast dream seems to hover not very far away. Once started in my brain, the pictures refused to go away, and I saw him sleeping in that cold, tenantless mansion with the strange little waif who was afraid of its ghosts, both together in the shadows, under a single horseman's cloak, or wandering in the companionship of the spectral Anne, or, later still, on his way to the eternal rendezvous at the foot of Great Titchfield Street, the rendezvous she was never able to keep. What an unutterable gloom! What an untold horror of sorrow and suffering comes over me as I try to realise something of what that man, boy he then was, must have taken into his lonely heart. As I came up the alley, I saw a light in the top window, and her and a head and shoulders thrown in an exaggerated shadow upon the blind. I wondered what the sun could be doing up there at such an hour. November 5th. This morning, while writing, someone came up the creaking stairs and knocks cautiously at my door. Thinking it was the landlady, I said, Come in. The knock was repeated and I cried louder, Come in, come in. But no one turned the handle, and I continued my writing with a vexed, Well, stay out then, under my breath. Went on writing? I tried to, but my thoughts had suddenly dried up at their source. I could not set down a single word. It was a dark, yellow fog morning, and there was little enough inspiration in the air as it was, but that stupid woman standing just outside my door, waiting to be told again to come in, roused a spirit of vexation that filled my head to the exclusion of all else. At last I jumped up and opened the door myself. "'What do you want, and why in the world don't you come in?' I cried out. 
but the words dropped into empty air. There was no one there. The fog poured up the dingy staircase in deep yellow coils, but there was no sign of a human being anywhere. I slammed the door, with imprecations upon the house and its noises, and went back to my work. A few minutes later, Emily came in with a letter. Were you or Mrs. Monson outside a few minutes ago, knocking at my door? No, sir. Are you sure? Mrs. Monson's gone to market, and there's no one but me and the child in the old house. I've been washing the dishes for the last hour, sir. I fancied the girl's face turned a shade of pale. I saw it a shade paler. She fidgeted towards the door with a glance over her shoulder. Wait, Emily, I said, and then told her what I had heard. She stared stupidly at me, though her eyes shifted now and then over the articles in the room. Who was it? I asked when I had come to the end. Mrs. Monson says it's only mice, she says, as if repeating a learned lesson. Mice! I exclaimed. It's nothing of the sort. Someone was feeling about outside my door. Who was it? Is the son in the house? Her whole manner changed suddenly, and she became earnest instead of evasive. She seemed anxious to tell the truth. Well, she seemed anxious to tell the truth. Oh, no, sir, there's no one in the house at all but you and me and the child, and there couldn't have been nobody at your door. As for them knocks, she stops abruptly, as though she had said too much. Well, what about the knocks? I said more gently. Of course, she stammered. The, the, the knocks isn't mice, nor, nor the footsteps neither, but, 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 but then... Again, she came to a full halt. Anything wrong with the house? Oh, no, sir, the drains is splendid. I don't mean the drains, girl. I mean, did anything, anything bad ever happen here? She flushed up to the roots of her hair, and then turned suddenly pale again. She was obviously in considerable distress, and there was something she was anxious, yet afraid to tell. Some forbidden thing she was not allowed to mention. Don't, don't mind what it was, only I should like to know. I said encouragingly. Raising her frightened eyes to my face, she began to blurt out something about that which happened once to a gentleman that lived upstairs, when a shrill voice calling her name sounded below. Emily! Emily! It was the returning landlady, and the girl tumbled downstairs as if pulled backwards by a rope, leaving me full of conjectures as to what in the world could have happened to a gentleman upstairs that could in so curious a manner affect my ears downstairs. Jimmy snuggled up right into the wheels of the chair. Great. November 10th. I have done capital work. Have finished the ponderous article and had it accepted for the review and another one ordered. I feel well and cheerful and have regular exercise and good sleep. No headaches, no nerves, no liver. Those pills the chemist recommended are wonderful. I can watch the child playing with his cart and feel no annoyances. Sometimes I almost feel inclined to join him. Even the grey-faced landlady rouses pity in me. I am sorry for her. So worn, so weary, so oddly put together, just like the building. She looks as if she had once suffered some shock of terror and was momentarily dreading another. When I spoke to her today very gently about not putting the pens in the ashtray and the, the gloves on the hook shelf, she raised her faint eyes to mine for the first time and said, with the ghost of a smile, I'll try to remember, sir. I felt inclined to pat her on the back and say, Come, cheer up and be jolly. Life's not so bad after all. Oh, I am much better. There's nothing like open air and success and good sleep. They build up as if by magic the portions of the heart eaten down by despair and unsatisfied yearnings. Even to the cats I feel friendly. When I came in at eleven o'clock tonight, they followed me to the door in a stream, and I stopped and stooped down to stroke the one nearest to me. Ah, the brute hissed and spat and struck at me with her paws. The claw caught my hand and drew blood in a thin line. The others danced sideways into the darkness, screeching as though I had done them an injury. I believe these cats really hate me. Perhaps they are only waiting to be reinforced. Then they will attack me. 
<laughs> in spite of the momentary annoyance, this fancy sent me laughing upstairs into my room. The fire was out, and the room seemed unusually cold. As I groped my way over to the mantelpiece to find the matches, I realised all at once that there was another person standing beside me in the darkness. I could, of course, see nothing, but my fingers feeling along the edge came into forcible contact with something that was at once withdrawn. It was cold and moist. I could have sworn it was somebody's hand. My flesh began to creep instantly. "'Who's that?' I exclaimed in a loud voice. My voice dropped into the silence like a pebble into a deep well. There was no answer, but at the same moment I heard someone moving away from me across the room in the direction of the door. It was a confused sort of footstep and the sound of garments brushing the furniture on the way. The same second my hand stumbled upon the matchbox and I struck a light. I expected to see Mrs. Monson, or Emily, or perhaps the son who is something on an omnibus. But the flare of the gas jet illumined an empty room. There was not a sign of a person anywhere. I felt the hair stir upon my head, and instinctively I backed up against the wall, lest something should approach me from behind. I was distinctly alarmed, but the next minute I recovered myself. The door was open onto the landing, and I crossed the room, not without some inward trepidation, and went out. The light from the room fell upon the stairs, but there was no one to be seen anywhere, nor was there any sound on the creaking wooden staircase to indicate a departing creature. I was in the act of turning to go in again, when a sound overhead caught my ear. It was a very faint sound not unlike the sigh of wind. Yet it could not have been the wind, for the night was still as the grave. Though it was not repeated, I resolved to go upstairs and see for myself what it all meant. Two senses had been affected, touch and hearing, and I could not believe that I had been deceived. So, with a lighted candle, I went stealthily forth on my unpleasant journey into the upper regions of this queer little old house. On the first landing there was only one door, and it was locked. On the second there was also only one door, but when I turned the handle it opened. There came forth to meet me the chill, musty air that is characteristic of a long, unoccupied room. With it there came an indescribable odour. I use the adjective advisedly. Though very faint, diluted as it were, it was nevertheless an odour that made my gorge rise. I have never smelt anything like it before, and I cannot describe it. The room was small and square, close under the roof, with a sloping ceiling and two tiny windows. It was cold as the grave, without a shred of carpet or a stick of furniture. The icy atmosphere and the nameless odour combined to make the room abominable to me, and, after lingering a moment to see that it contained no cupboards or corners into which a person might have crept for concealment, I made haste to shut the door and went downstairs again to bed. Evidently I had been deceived after all as to the noise. In the night, I had a foolish but very vivid dream. I dreamed that the landlady and another person, dark and not properly visible, entered my room on all fours, followed by a horde of immense cats. They attacked me as I lay in bed and murdered me, and then dragged my body upstairs and deposited it on the floor of that cold little square room under the roof. November 11th since my talk with Emily, the unfinished talk, I have hardly once set eyes on her. Mrs. Monson now attends wholly to my wants. As usual, she does everything exactly as I don't like it done. It is all too utterly trivial to mention, but it is exceedingly irritating. Like small doses of morphine often repeated, she has finally a cumulative effect. November 12th. This morning I woke early and came into the front room to get a book, meaning to read in bed till it was time to get up. Emily was laying the fire. 
"'Good morning,' I said cheerfully. "'Mind you make a good fire, it's very cold.' The girl turned and showed me a startled face. It was not Emily at all. "'Where's Emily?' I exclaimed. "'You mean the girl as was here before me?' "'Has Emily left?' "'I came on the sixth, she replied suddenly. "'And she gone then?' I got my book and went back to bed. Emily must have been sent away almost immediately after our conversation. This reflection kept coming between me and the printed page. I was glad when it was time to get up. Such prompt energy, such merciless decision, seemed to argue something of importance to somebody. November 13th the wound inflicted by the cat's claw has swollen and causes me annoyance and some pain. It throbs and itches. I'm afraid my blood must be in poor condition or it would have healed by now. I opened it with a penknife soaked in an antiseptic solution and cleansed it thoroughly. I have heard unpleasant stories of the results of wounds inflicted by cats. November 14th in spite of the curious effect this house certainly exercises upon my nerves, I like it. It is lonely and deserted in the very heart of London, but it is also for that reason quiet to work in. I wonder why it is so cheap. Some people might be suspicious, but I did not even ask the reason. No answer is better than a lie. If only I could remove the cats from the outside and the rats from the inside. I feel that I shall grow accustomed more and more to its peculiarities, and shall die here. Ah, that, that expression reads queerly, and it gives a wrong impression. I, I meant live and die here. I shall renew the lease from year to year till one of us crumbles to pieces. From present indications, the building will be the first to go. And that is where we shall take a break. Bum, bum, bum sure it's fine um yeah let's let's take a break you've got i'm gonna start a five minute timer for both yourselves and me to uh, you know stretch your limbs stretch your meat as we discovered on wildermyth last night um rotate your fluids um and and all those other things and yeah see you back here you know do whatever you, you want to do on a break you know uh, was it? Oh, was it a range of meats? It might have been a range of meats. Uh, it's something, w one of the two. I'm not sure, but it broke JD. Um, right. Yes. Anyway, five minute break. See you back here in a bit. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello everybody, welcome back. I hope that you have had a, a satisfactory break. Hello Thunder, welcome in. Um, right, stuff. Uh, Andy Pants, I saw you say that the abbreviations for old British money baffle you, and I I had to look it up, because in the, in the book, as you'll have seen in the text on Gutenberg, which we'll get to in a second, um, it's pence is abbreviated as D, and I was like, I don't... S is obviously going to be shillings, and I'm hoping it is shillings, because I didn't even look that one up, I'm just hoping I no-scoped it. Um, but I was like, what? I can't think of any unit that would be D, and so I had to look it up, and literally it was one of the suggested Google searches, uh, like old British currency D. Um, and yeah from what i could find out that was um pennies which you know i i just called us pence um and apparently that's it was the d sounds like denarius or something so i guess we sort of took that from rome and i yeah like i don't understand why we did that cuz you know obviously why why not <laughs> Why, why, why not use a word, a different word with a different letter? Um, the BSL for pound is finger spelling L, which never made sense to you until you. Oh, okay. That I mean, that doesn't also make sense to me now hearing it, but I'll I'll defer to you. Um, neat. Okay. And today we're all learning. Um, the sinister con conclave of cats. Yep. Good. So yeah, I saw you. I kind of glanced up and saw you say the Gutenberg edition skips straight from October seventeenth to the twenty fourth, and also misses out October thirtieth. That is, oh, Librum is pound. Oh, okay. Why, why, why did, why, why are we like this? Why would we do this? We have, what's what's the L short for? Pound. Oh, and and the and the and the D pennies. Why? Uh, you think Gutenberg one squarely cuts out and you mentioned the little kid. Weird. Okay. Interesting. I, I, I mean, in general, I have, I have some thoughts and opinions on this story that I will, I won't get into now, but I will get into at the end. Um, because I feel like it's another one, possibly worth a bit of a discussion. Um, which, you know, you're welcome to start on in chat. Also, yeah, Joey is still snuggled up to the wheels of this chair, so I can't move. Um, <laughs> the fact that this LSD always makes you laugh when you were younger. Nice. <laughs> I'd be curious another source I digitized it from. Yeah, like I, I did. I tried having a quick look to see if I could find another text on Gutenberg at least, and it just from well putting words into Google. This is the only one I could find. There, there will be another one out there. But, um, yeah, it's it's always odd to me when you find, like, two competing versions of the text. With one with just bits straight up removed. Um, was there anything else I was going to say? <coughs> I mean, yeah, we've, we've had the, the definitely not foreshadowing. I just happened to stop into a conference and sort of zoned out while the guy was talking, except for this one bit which I happened to wake up and hear him say, which seemed odd to me and interesting. Anyway, on with the show. Um, there was that. You know, that's... Yeah. Um... So I feel like there were some other things I was gonna... I was gonna say, no, I completely forgot what they were. Good. Great. Um... Oh! Depeche Mode. Yeah, I just, um... Is is the trigger warning bit finished? Um, that bit is, but it will be back again for the end of the story. Which I don't feel is too big a spoiler, because it's kind of very bluntly foreshadowed. Um, yeah. So, but, like, this isn't going to be the entire rest of the stream. Um, no worries at all, Thunder. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is kind of an integral point to the story, unfortunately. Um, no, it's, I, yeah, I, I popped over to Discord to have a listen to the Depeche Mode song, and it is exactly as I thought. I don't know it by name, but literally I saw the start of the video, like just the four of their faces, and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I know the song. Um, it's, yeah. 
There's there's a number of like eighties bands. All of like that kind of similar genre, which I I will know like the big songs by all of them, but not by name, and I tend to like mix the names up. Because I'm 41, I'm not 51. Which is to say I was a child during that era, not a teenager, when I would remember these things. Anyway, I sat and talked far too much history. So let's sit and talk some more. We shall carry on with... What's the story called? The Listener by Algernon Blackwood. November 16th. It is abominable the way my nerves go up and down with me, and rather discouraging. This morning I woke to find my clothes scattered about the room and a cane chair overturned beside my bed. The coat and waistcoat looked just as if they had been tried on by someone in the night. I had horribly vivid dreams, too, in which someone covering his face with his hands kept coming close to me, crying out as if in pain. Where can I find covering? Oh, who will clothe me? How silly, and yet it frightened me a little. I was so dreadfully real, for it was so dreadfully real. It is now over a year since I last walked in my sleep and woke up with such a shock on the cold pavement of Earl's Court Road, where I then lived. I thought I was cured, but evidently not. This discovery has rather a disquieting effect upon me. Tonight I shall resort to the old trick of tying my toe to the bedpost. November 17th. Last night I was again troubled by most oppressive dreams. Someone seemed to be moving in the night up and down my room, sometimes passing into the front room, and then returning to stand beside the bed and stare intently down upon me. I was being watched by this person all night long. I never actually awoke, though I was often very near it. I suppose it was a nightmare from indigestion, for this morning I have one of my old vile headaches. Yet all my clothes lay about the floor when I awoke where they had evidently been flung. Had I so tossed them? During the dark hours, and my trousers trailed over the step into the front room. Worse than this, though, I fancied I noticed about the room in the morning that strange fetid odour. Though very faint, its mere suggestion is foul and nauseating. What in the world can it be, I wonder? In future I shall lock my door. November 26th I have accomplished a lot of good work during this past week, and have also managed to get regular exercise. I have felt well and in an equable state of mind. Only two things have occurred to disturb my equanimity. The first is trivial in itself and no doubt to be easily explained. The upper window where I saw the light on the night of November 4th, with the shadow of a large head and shoulders upon the blind, is one of the windows in the square room under the roof. In reality it has no blind at all. Here is the other thing. I was coming home last night, in a fresh fall of snow about eleven o'clock, my umbrella low down over my head. Halfway up the alley, where the snow was wholly untrodden, I saw a man's legs in front of me. The umbrella hid the rest of his figure, but on raising it I saw that he was tall and broad and was walking, as I was, towards the door of my house. He could not have been but four feet ahead of me. I had thought the alley was empty when I entered it, but might, of course, have been mistaken very easily. A sudden gust of wind compelled me to lower the umbrella, and when I raised it again, not half a minute later, there was no longer any man to be seen. With a few more steps I reached the door. It was closed as usual. Then I noticed, with a sudden sensation of dismay, that the surface of the freshly fallen snow was unbroken. My own footmarks were the only ones to be seen anywhere, and though I retraced my way to the point where I had first seen the man, I could find not the slightest impression of any other boots. Feeling creepy and uncomfortable, I went upstairs and was glad to get into bed. November 28th With the fastening of my bedroom door, the disturbances ceased. I am convinced that I walked in my sleep. Probably I untied my toe, and then tied it up again. The fancied security of the locked door would alone have been enough to restore sleep to my troubled spirit, 
and enable me to rest quietly. Last night, however, the annoyance was suddenly renewed another and more suddenly renewed in another and more aggressive form. I woke in the darkness with the impression that someone was standing outside my bedroom door, listening. As I became more awake, the impression grew into positive knowledge. Though there was no appreciable sound of moving or breathing, I was so convinced of the propinquity of a listener that I crept out of bed and approached the door. As I did so, there came faintly from the next room the unmistakable sound of someone retreating stealthily across the floor. Yet, as I heard it, it was neither the tread of a man nor a regular footstep, but rather it seemed to me a confused sort of crawling, almost as if someone on his hands and knees, or as of someone on his hands and knees. I unlocked the door in less than a second and passed quickly into the front room, and I could feel, as by the subtlest imaginable vibrations upon my nerves, that the spot I was standing in had just that instant been vacated. The listener had moved. He was now behind the other door, standing in the passage. Yet this door was also closed. I moved swiftly and as silently as possible across the floor and turned the handle. A cold rush of air met me from the passage and sent, a sh sent shiver after shiver down my back. There was no one in the doorway. There was no one on the little landing. There was no one moving down the staircase. Yet I had been so quick that the midnight listener could not be very far away, and I felt that if I persevered I should eventually come face to face with him. And the courage that came so opportunely to overcome my nervousness and horror seemed born of the unwelcome conviction that it was somehow necessary for my safety as well as my sanity that I should find this intruder and force his secret from him. For was it not the intent action of his mind upon my own, in concentrated listening, that had awakened me with such a vivid realization of his presence? Advancing across the narrow landing, I peered down into the well of the little house. There was nothing to be seen. No one was moving in the darkness. How cold the oilcloth was to my bare feet. I cannot say what it was that suddenly drew my eyes upwards. I only know that, without apparent reason, I looked up and saw a person about halfway up the next turn of the stairs, leaning, leaning forward over the balustrade and staring straight into my face. It was a man. He appeared to be clinging to the rail rather than standing on the stairs. The gloom made it impossible to see much beyond the general outline, but the head and shoulders were seemingly enormous and stood sharply silhouetted against the skylight in the roof immediately above. The idea flashed into my brain in a moment that I was looking into the visage of something monstrous. The huge skull, the mane-like hair, the wide humped shoulders suggested in a way I did not pause to analyse that which was scarcely human. And for some seconds, fascinated by horror, I returned the gaze and stared into the dark, inscrutable countenance above me, without knowing exactly where I was or what I was doing. Then I realized in quite a new way that I was face to face with the secret midnight listener, and I steeled myself as best I could for what was about to come. The source of the rash courage that came to me at this awful moment will ever be to me an inexplicable mystery. Though shivering with fear, and my forehead wet with an unholy dew, I resolved to advance. Twenty questions leaped to my lips. What are you? What do you want? Why do you listen and watch? Why do you come into my room? But none of them found articulate utterance. I began forthwith to climb the stairs, and with the first signs of my advance he drew himself back into the shadows and began to move. He retreated as swiftly as I advanced. I heard the sound of his crawling motion a few steps ahead of me, ever maintaining the same distance. When I reached the landing he was halfway up the next flight, and when I was halfway up the next flight he had already arrived at the top landing. I then heard him open the door of the little square room under the roof and go in. Immediately, though the door did not close after him, the sound of his moving entirely ceased. 
At this moment, I longed for a light, or a stick, or any weapon whatsoever. But I had none of these things, and it was impossible to go back. So I marched steadily up the rest of the stairs, and in less than a minute found myself standing in the gloom, face to face with the door through which this creature had just entered. For a moment, I hesitated. The door was open, sorry, the door was about halfway open, and the listener was standing evidently in his favourite attitude just behind it, listening. To search through the dark room for him seemed hopeless. To enter the same small space where he was seemed horrible. The very idea filled me with loathing, and I almost decided to turn back. It is strange at such times how trivial things impinge on the consciousness with a shock as of something important and immense. Something, it may have been a beetle or a mouse, scuttled over the bare boards behind me. The door moved a quarter of an inch, closing. My decision came back with a sudden rush, as it were, and thrusting out a foot I kicked the door so that it swung sharply back to its full extent, and permitted me to walk forward slowly into the aperture of profound blackness beyond. What a queer, soft sound my bare feet made on the boards, how the blood sang and buzzed in my head. I was inside. The darkness closed over me, hiding even the windows. I began to grope my way round the walls in a thorough search, but in order to prevent all possibility of the other's escape, I first of all closed the door. There we were, we two, shut in together between four walls within a few feet of one another. But with that, with whom was I thus momentarily imprisoned? So, but with what, with whom, was I thus momentarily imprisoned? A new light flashed suddenly over the affair with a swift, illuminating brilliance, and I knew I was a fool, an utter fool. I was wide awake at last, and the horror was evaporating. My cursed nerves again, a dream, a nightmare, and the old result, walking in my sleep. The figure was a dream figure. Many a time before had the actors in my dreams stood before me for some moments after I was awake. There was a chance match in my pyjamas pocket, and I struck it on the wall. The room was utterly empty. It held not even a shadow. I went quickly down to bed, cursing my wretched nerves and my foolish, vivid dreams. But as soon as ever I was asleep again, the same uncouth figure of a man crept back to my bedside, and bending over me with his immense head close to my ear, whispered repeatedly in my dreams, I want your body. I want its covering. I'm waiting for it, and listening always. Words scarcely less foolish than the dream. I wonder what the queer odour was in the square room. I noticed it again, and stronger than ever before, and it seemed to be also in my bedroom when I woke this morning. November 29th Slowly, as moonbeams rise over a misty sea in June, the thought is entering my mind that my nerves and somnambulistic dreams do not adequately account for the influence this house exercises upon me. It holds me as with a fine, invisible net. I cannot escape if I would. It draws me, and it means to keep me. November 30th. The post this morning brought me a letter from Aden, forwarded from my old rooms, forwarded from my old rooms in Earl's Court. It was from Chapter, my former Trinity chum, who is on his way home from the east and asks for my address. I sent it to him at the hotel he mentioned to await, await arrival. As I have already said, my windows command a view of the alley, and I can see an arrival without difficulty. This morning, while I was busy writing, the sound of footsteps coming up the alley filled me with a sense of vague alarm that I could in no way account for. I went over to the window and saw a man standing below waiting for the door to be opened. 
His shoulders were broad, his top hat glossy, and his overcoat fitted beautifully round the collar. All this I could see, but no more. Presently the door was opened, and the shock to my nerves was unmistakable when I heard a man's voice ask, Is Mr. still here? mentioning my name. I could not catch the answer, but it could only have been in the affirmative, for the man entered the hall and the door shut to behind him. But I waited in vain for the sound of his steps on the stairs. There was no sound of any kind. It seemed to me so strange that I opened my door and looked out. No one was anywhere to be seen. I walked across the narrow landing and looked through the window that commands the whole length of the alley. There was no sign of a human being coming or going. The lane was deserted. Then I deliberately walked downstairs into the kitchen and asked the grey-faced landlady if a gentleman had just that minute called for me. The answer, given with an odd, weary sort of smile, was no. December 1st. I feel genuinely alarmed and uneasy over the state of my nerves. Dreams are dreams, but never before have I had dreams in broad daylight. I am looking forward very much to Chapter's arrival. He is a capital fellow, vigorous, healthy, with no nerves and even less imagination, and he has two thousand pounds a year into the bargain. Periodically he makes me offers. The last was to travel round the world with him as secretary, which was a delicate way of paying my expenses and giving me some pocket money. Offers, however, which I invariably decline. I prefer to keep his friendship. Women could not come between us. Money might, therefore I give it no opportunity. Chapter always laughed at what he called my fancies, being himself possessed only of that thin-blooded quality of imagination which is ever associated with the prosaic-minded man. Yet, if taunted with this obvious lack, his wrath is deeply stirred. His psychology is that of the crass materialist. Always a rather funny article. It will afford me genuine relief, nonetheless, to hear the cold judgment his mind will have to pass upon the story of this house, as I shall have to tell it. Or as I shall have it to tell. December 2nd. The strangest part of it all I have not referred to in this brief diary. Truth to tell, I have been afraid to set it down in black and white. I have kept it in the background of my thoughts, preventing it as far as possible from taking shape. In spite of my efforts, however, it has continued to grow stronger. Now that I come to face the issue squarely, it is harder to express than I imagined. Like a half-remembered melody that trips in the head but vanishes the moment you try to sing it, these thoughts form a group in the background of my mind, behind my mind, as it were, and refuse to come forward. They are crouching, ready to spring, but the actual leap never takes place. In these rooms, except when my mind is strongly concentrated on my own work, I find myself suddenly dealing in thoughts and ideas that are not my own. New, strange conceptions, wholly foreign to my temperament, are forever cropping up in my head. What precisely they are is of no particular importance. The point is that they are entirely apart from the channel in which my thoughts have hitherto been accustomed to flow. Especially they come when my mind is at rest, unoccupied. When I am dreaming over the fire, or sitting with a book which fails to hold my attention. These, then, these thoughts which are not mine spring into life and make me feel exceedingly uncomfortable. Sometimes they are so strong that I almost feel as if someone were in the room beside me, thinking aloud. Evidently, my nerves and liver are shockingly out of order. I must work harder and take more vigorous exercise. The horrid thoughts never came when my mind is much occupied. But they are always there, waiting and, as it were, alive. What I have attempted to describe above came first upon me gradually after I, after I had been some days in the house, and then grew steadily in strength. The other strange thing has come to me only twice in all these weeks. 
it appalls me. It is the, con the consciousness of the propinquity of some deadly and loathsome disease. It comes over me like a wave of fever heat, then passes off, leaving me cold and trembling. The air seems for a few seconds to become tainted. So penetrating and convincing is the thought of this sickness that on both occasions my brain has turned momentarily dizzy, and through my mind, like flames of white heat, have flashed the ominous names of all the dangerous illnesses I know. I can no more explain these visitations than I can fly, yet I know there is no dreaming about the clammy skin and palpitating heart which they always leave as witnesses of their brief visit. Most strongly of all was I aware of this nearness of a mortal sickness when, on the night of the 28th, I went upstairs in pursuit of the listening figure. When we were shut in together, in that little square room under the roof, I felt that I was face to face with the actual essence of this invisible and malignant disease. Such a feeling never entered my heart before, and I pray to God it may never again. There. Now I have confessed. I have given some expression, at least, to the feelings that so far I have been afraid to see in my own writing. For, since I can no longer deceive myself, the experiences of that night, the 28th, were no more a dream than my daily breakfast is a dream, and the trivial entry in this diary by which I sought to explain away an occurrence that caused me unutterable horror was due solely to my desire not to acknowledge in words what I really felt and believed to be true. The increase that would have accrued to my horror by so doing might have been more than I could stand. December 3rd. I wish chapter would come. My facts are already marshalled, and I can see his cool grey eyes fixed, incredul fixed incredulously on my face as I relate them. The knocking at my door, the well-dressed caller, the light in the upper window and the shadow upon the blind, the man who preceded me in the snow, the scattering of my clothes at night, Emily's arrested confession, the landlady's suspicious reticence, the midnight listener on the stairs, and those awful subsequent words in my sleep, and above all, the hardest to tell, the presence of the abominable sickness and the stream of thoughts and ideas that are not my own. I can see Chapter's face, and I can almost hear his deliberate words. You've been at the tea again, and under feeding, I expect, as usual. Excuse the loud cars. Better see my nerve doctor, and then come with me to the south of France. For this fellow who knows nothing of disordered liver or high-strung nerves, goes regularly to a great nerve specialist with the periodical belief that his nervous system is beginning to decay. On December 5th. Ever since the incident of the listener, I have kept a night light burning in my bedroom, and my sleep has been undisturbed. Last night, however, I was subjected to a far worse annoyance. I woke suddenly, and saw a man in front of the dressing table regarding himself in the mirror. The door was locked as usual. I knew at once it was the listener, and the blood turned to ice in my veins. Such a wave of horror and dread swept over me that it seemed to turn me rigid in the bed, and I could neither move nor speak. I noted, however, that the odour I so abhorred was strong in the room. The man seems to be tall and broad. He was stooping forward over the mirror. His back was turned to me, but in the glass I saw the reflection of a huge head and face, illumined fitfully by the flicker of the nightlight, the spectral grey of the very early morning stealing in round the edges of the curtains, lent an additional horror to the picture, for it fell upon the hair that was tawny and mane-like hanging loosely about a face whose swollen rugose features bore the once-seen, never-forgotten leonine expression of... I dare not write that awful word. But, by way of corroborative proof, I saw on the faint... I saw in the faint mingling of the two lights that there were several bronze-coloured blotches on the cheeks which the man was evidently examining with great care in the glass. The lips were pale and very thick and large. One hand I could not see, but the other rested on the ivory back of my hairbrush. Its muscles were strangely contracted, 
the fingers thin to emaciation, the back of the hand close, closely puckered up. It was like a big grey spider crouching to spring, or the claw of a great bird. The full realisation that I was alone in the room with this nameless creature almost within arm's reach of him overcame me to such a degree that, when he suddenly turned and regarded me with small beady eyes wholly out of proportion with the grandeur of their massive setting, I sat bolt upright in bed, uttered a loud cry, and then fell back in a dead swoon of terror upon the bed. December 5th when I came to this morning, the first thing I noticed was that my clothes were strewn all over the floor. I find it difficult to put my thoughts together and have sudden accesses, accesses of violent trembling. I determined that I would go at once to Chapter's Hotel and find out when he is expected. I cannot refer to what happened in the night. It is too awful, and I have to keep my thoughts rigorously away from it. I feel light-headed and queer couldn't eat any breakfast, and have twice vomited with blood. While dressing to go out, a hansom rattled up noisily over the cobbles, and a minute later the door opened, and to my great joy in walked the very subject of my thoughts. The sight of his strong face and quiet eyes had an immediate effect upon me, and I grew calmer again. His very handshake was a sort of tonic. But, as I listened, eagerly to the deep tones of his reassuring voice and the visions of the night time sorry and the visions of the night time paled a little i began to realize how very hard it was going to be to tell him my wild intangible tale some men radiate an animal vigor that destroys the delicate woof of a vision and effectually prevents its re reconstruction chapter was one of these men we talked of incidents that had filled the interval since last we met, and he told me something of his travels. He talked, and I listened. But so full was I of the horrid thing I had to tell that I made a poor listener. I was for ever watching my opportunity to leap in and explode it all under his nose. Before very long, however, it was borne in upon me that he, too, was merely talking for time. He too held something of importance in the background of his mind, something too weighty to let fall till the right moment presented itself. So that during the whole of the first half hour we were both waiting for the psychological moment in which in which to proper in which properly to release our respective bombs, and the intensity of our mind's action set up opposing forces that merely sufficed to hold one another in check, and nothing more. As soon as I realised this, therefore, I resolved to yield. I renounced for the time my purpose of telling my story, and had the satisfaction of seeing that his mind, released from the restraint of my own, at once began to make preparations for the discharge of its momentous burden. The talk grew less and less magnetic, the interest waned, the descriptions of his travels became less alive, there were pauses between his sentences. Presently he repeated himself, his words clothed no living thoughts, the pauses grew longer. Then the interest dwindled altogether, and he went out like a candle in the wind. His voice ceased, and he looked up squarely into my face, with, a serious, with serious and anxious eyes. The psychological moment had come at last. I say, he began, and then stopped short. I made an unconscious gesture of encouragement, but said no word. I dreaded the impending disclosure exceedingly. A dark shadow seems to precede it. I say, he blurted out at last, what in the world made you ever come to this place? To these rooms, I mean. They're cheap, for one thing, I began. And central, and... They're too cheap, he interrupted. Didn't you ask what made them so cheap? It never occurred to me at the time. There was a pause in which he avoided my eyes. For God's sake, go on, man, and tell it, I cried, for the suspense was getting more than I could stand in my nervous condition. This was where Blount lived so long, he said quietly, and where he died. You know, in the old days I often used to come here and see him, and, 
and do what I could to alleviate his... He stuck fast again. Well, I said with a great effort, please go on, faster. But... Chapter went on, turning his face to the window with a perceptible shiver. He finally got so terrible I simply couldn't stand it, though I always thought I could stand anything. It got on my nerves and made me dream and haunted me day and night. I stared at him and said nothing. I had never heard of Blount in my life and didn't know what he was talking about. But all the same I was trembling and my mouth had become strangely dry. This is the first time I've been back here since... He said, almost in a whisper. And, upon my word, it gives me the creeps. I swear it isn't fit for a man to live in. I never saw you look so bad, old man. Chapter shuddered and buttoned his overcoat up to his neck. Then he spoke in a low voice, looking occasionally behind him as though he thought someone was listening. I too could have sworn someone else was in the room with us. And since we've just had raiders come in from Dave, I'm just going to point out that at the start of this I gave a bit of a content warning for like self-harm slash suicide and stuff. So just to be advised, that's kind of the bit that we're getting into right now. If that's not something you want to hear, you may want to duck out. But also welcome in, Dave. Thank you. He did it himself, you know, and no one blamed him a bit. His sufferings were awful. For the last two years, he used to wear a veil when he went out and... And even then it was always in a closed carriage. Even the attendant who had nursed him for so long was at length obliged to leave. The extremities of both the lower limbs were gone, dropped off, and he moved about the ground on all fours with a sort of crawling motion. The odour, too, was... I was obliged to interrupt him here. I could hear no more details of that sort. My, my skin was moist. I felt hot and cold by turns, for at last I was beginning to understand. Poor devil, Chapter went on. I used to keep my eyes closed as much as possible. He always begged to be allowed to take his veil off and asked if I minded very much. I, I used to stand by the open window. He never touched me, though. He rented the whole house. Nothing would induce him to leave it. Did he occupy th these very rooms? No. He had the little room on the top floor, the square one just under the roof. He preferred it because it was dark. These rooms were too near the ground and he was afraid people might see him through the windows. The crowd had been known to follow him up to the very door and then stand below the windows in the hope of catching a glimpse of his face. But there were hospitals. He wouldn't go near one and they didn't like to force him. You know, they'd say it's not contagious so there was nothing to prevent his staying here if he wanted to. He spent all his time reading medical books about drugs and so on. His head and face were something appalling, just like a lion's. I held up my hands to arrest further description. He was a burden to the world, and he knew it. One night, I suppose, he realised it too keenly to wish to live. He had the free use of drugs, and in the morning he was found dead on the floor. Two years ago, that was and they said he still had several years to live. Then, in heaven's name, I cried, unable to bear the suspense any longer, tell me what it was he had and be quick about it. I thought you knew, he exclaimed with genuine surprise, I thought you knew. He leaned forward and our eyes met. In a scarcely audible whisper, I caught the words his lips seemed almost afraid to utter. He was a leper. The end. And so, welcome in, Dave and Raiders. You came in right at the end of that story. A leopard, what a twist. Yeah, so let's just get right down to it. I don't like that ending. <laughs> I feel like within this story, there is a lot of, a lot of the, the I'm just going to like finish reading story immediately proceed to dunk all over story because you know not everything that we read on here can be better than the last thing we read as much as we would like and so I was reading this one earlier today and there is I feel plenty in here that is good in terms of Algernon Blackwood observation excuse me 
observation and atmosphere and like spooky settings and stuff like that. The, the, the kind of things that I like. But, yeah, firstly, from like a, from a modern-day perspective, looking back and being like, wow, okay, so you, you've got, like, suicide turns you into a ghost that haunts the house, and then, like so many horror stories, it had an amazing setup and build, but failed to stick the landing. Yeah, and it's like that... The, the, like... I don't know, the, the delivery, like, for, for, for the big reveal to be right at the end that, oh, this man had leprosy. I feel like it maybe hit harder at its time than it does now. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, I don't know... I, yeah, like, I, 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 am, I am ignorant of... I think it was 1917 I saw this was written and published, of, like, perceptions of leprosy at the time. Obviously now it's still not something you're like, ooh, everyone wants that. It's, you know, it's still a, a, an unfortunate disease that people don't want to get. Um, and I know it's it's had that sort of stigma of, like, yeah, frankly, you know, the the way it's described um, and stuff. And so, I I get that perceptions of it have changed over the years. Um, but yeah, for it to build up and that that to be like the big, not twist, but like the big kind of shocking reveal ending that oh, I I guess I'm just like what what's the big deal to a point where it's almost absurd enough that it comes across like a punchline to me like oh wait is this like a joke or something um falls into the trap of guy comes in at the end and just very neatly explains all the things you really should have mostly picked up if we were paying attention well that and the 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 mid-story foreshadowing of as i said like just after the break i happen on on this day i happened to wander out and go to a just a talk that was going on in in the town and I fell asleep and through the entire thing because I was kind of bored and tired. Um, but I woke up for the bit that describes exactly the thing that is happening in this story. Hmm, I wonder what the deal is with that. Anyway, um, like that, that I feel... Yeah, I, I would be... I would be interested to know the circumstances of this story's writing. Because, like, again, as I say, there's there's a lot of... A lot of those very good to me out and on Blackwood like details and touches and, and sort of thing, things that he does that I really like with his stories and then there's some stuff that just feels extremely formulaic and thoroughly like yeah sort of by numbers um, and yeah like kind of uncharacteristic of the rest of his stuff that I've read um, which, yeah, it's that, that it sort of it strikes me as odd. Um, even feel like the heavy-handed foreshadowing would have been okay if something had happened at the end, besides just explanation. Yeah, and like, and it and it also it does like the weird thing of almost like it's setting up a whole bunch of different possibilities. Like you, you straight away have this this whole altercation that he brings up with his sister that that drove a rift between them, and she references his own fears over his mental stability because apparently that's a thing that's like that's in their family and it's clearly a, a point for him to worry about that so we have we have that established we've got um i'd need to go back now and go through it there's um yeah i, f I feel like there were like a number of different different sort of threads and strands set up like well like you said saying about the whole um in the the edition linked in chat that excises all mentions of the kid and this one you've got like you know this this child keeps doing these pulling his toy across the cobbles stuff and it's really annoying me and we we can just scrub that out of the story and it doesn't seemingly affect it in any way or the the repeated references to the the landlady's son who is something on a omnibus and there's there's like all all these different things and i don't know whether those are intended as like misdirection to make you think is it is it ghosts in the house is it his own fractured sanity is it other things is uh, like oh, is it any of these possibilities ah wait it was exactly what you foreshadowed like i don't yeah and so and so this is why i read it because it's you know again it's it's an interesting one to me it doesn't necessarily mean it's 
a great story, but it's it's fun and it's interesting to read something you don't necessarily like because it still helps to give you a point of reference on the stuff that you do. Like, yeah, it's, for, again, for someone who, as I was saying last week, I really loved getting back to reading out on Blackwood's writing because there's so much in here that I enjoy. To read something by this author that I'm like, eh, I'm not so sure about that one. Um, definitely had some excellently creepy moments. Exactly, and like again, like there's there's some really good bits in there. There's some some again with with the the writing of what is a pretty straightforward haunted house ghost story. Um, there's there's some good stuff. There are some good yeah unique um, you know Algernon Blackwood traits in there, and and then it just completely biffs the ending. Um, but hey can't win them all um and the yeah, i want your body line especially my delivery of it gave you the chills hey nice good mission accomplished yeah I, I i i did have a bit of fun reading that i i yeah like with um the telltale heart it turns out i kind of enjoy someone who is like having a bit of a sort of a flip between sort of trying to stay calm and absolute like yeah over boiling rage um it's it's fun and yeah getting to characterize some of this a little bit was a good time yeah there's it's 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 a real oddity this one i yeah anyway i promised that i would do two i haven't bothered to put it in the title um so i know we're running up on time but i've spent a lot of time this evening talking so if you would like to have one other short story this will not take long um and I've left this one here because I I feel like of the two this is this was the better one. Um, oh, I need to put a link in chat so you can read along if you would like. Hello, there we go. That's that. And we un no click and unpin. There we go. Uh, this is Ancient Light by the Weekend. That's a lie. It's a very good joke though. And to be fair, if you consume a lot of horror media, the trope of good setup botched ending is so typical of middle grade horror. Yes, true. Like, yeah, it's it is well because you know it, again, it's it's fun to fun to look at this as, say, like, as an artifact and sort of look at it, pick over it, and just sort of think to myself, if I were doing this, how would I do it differently? Because again, it's like, what's what can I learn from this? What can I take from this? What's good about it, and what would I change? How would I? Will I try to do more with the misdirects? Would I... Because, I'm, I'm, as I've said before, I'm also not a fan of, oh, I was just mad, and imagining the whole thing. <laughs> or was I? That's also just kind of cheap and played out. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's good to, to stop, and, stop and think about these. But, yeah, there is, there is your text in chat. If you would like to read along, or linked in the the comments below, if you're listening on YouTube, which I always forget to mention. And if you are ready, we shall have our second story for tonight. It'll be short. It is also by Algernon Blackwood, and it is called Ancient Lights. From South Water, where he left the train, the road led due west. That he knew. For the rest he trusted to luck, being one of those born walkers who dislike asking along the way. He had that instinct, and, as a rule, it served him well. A mile or so due west along the sandy road, till he come to, till he come to a stile on the right, then across the fields, you'll see the red house straight before you. He glanced at the postcard's instructions once again, and once again he tried to decipher the scratched-out sentence without success. It had been so elaborately inked over that no word was legible. Inked-out sentences in a letter were always enticing. He wondered what it was that had been so very carefully obliterated. The afternoon was boisterous, with a tearing, shouting wind that blew from the sea across the Sussex Weald. Massive clouds with rounded, piled-up edges cannoned across gaping spaces of blue sky. Far away the line of downs swept the horizon like an arriving wave. Chanctonbury Ring rode their crest, a scudding ship hull down before the wind. 
He took his hat off and walked rapidly, breathing great draughts of air with delight and exhilaration. The road was deserted. No horsemen, no bicycles or motors, not even a tradesman's cart, no single walker. But anyhow, he would never have asked the way. Keeping a sharp eye for the stile, he pounded along, while the wind tossed the cloak against his face and made waves across the blue puddles in the yellow road. The trees showed their under leaves of white. The bracken and the high new grass bent all one way. Great life was in the day, high spirits and dancing everywhere. And for a Croydon surveyor's clerk just out of his office, this was like a holiday at sea. It was a day for high adventure, and his heart rose up to meet the mood of nature. His umbrella with the silver ring ought to have been a sword, but his brown shoes should have been top boots with spurs, sorry, and his brown shoes should have been top boots with spurs upon the heels. Where hid the enchanted castle and the princess with the hair of sunny gold? His horse, the style, came suddenly into view and nipped adventure in the bud. Every day clothes took him prisoner again. He was a surveyor's clerk, middle-aged, earning three pounds a week, coming from Croydon to see about a client's proposed alterations in a wood, something to ensure a better view from the dining room window. Across the fields, perhaps a mile away, he saw the red house gleaming in the sunshine, and resting on the stile a moment to get his breath, he noticed a copse of oak and hornbeam on the right. Aha, he told himself, so that must be the wood he wants to cut down to improve the view. I'll have a look at it. There were boards up, of course, but there was an inviting little path as well. I'm not a trespasser, he said. It's part of my business, this is. He scrambled awkwardly over the gate and entered the copse. A little round would bring him to the field again. But the moment he passed among the trees, the wind ceased shouting, and the stillness dropped upon the world. So dense was the growth that the sunshine only came through in isolated patches. The air was close. He mopped his forehead and put his green felt hat on, but a low branch knocked it off again at once, and as he stopped, an elastic twig swung back and stung his face. There were flowers along both edges of the little path, Glades opened on either side, ferns curved about in damper corners, and the smell of earth and foliage was rich and sweet. It was cooler here. What an enchanting little wood, he thought, turning down a small green glade where the sunshine flickered like silver wings. And how it danced and fluttered and moved about. He put a dark blue flower in his buttonhole. Again his hat, caught by an oak branch as he rose, was knocked from his head, falling across his eyes, and this time he did not put it on again. Swinging his umbrella, he walked on with an uncovered head, whistling rather loudly as he went. But the thickness of the trees hardly encouraged whistling, and something of his gaiety and high spirits seemed to leave him. He suddenly found himself treading circumspectly and with caution, the stillness of the wood was so peculiar. There was a rustle among the ferns and leaves that something shot across and, and something shot across the path ten yards ahead, stopped abruptly an instant with head cocked sideways to stare, then dived again beneath the underbrush with the speed of a shadow. He started like a frightened child, laughing the next second that a mere pheasant could have made him jump. In the distance he heard wheels upon the road, and wondered why the sound was pleasant. "'Good old butcher's cart,' he said to himself, then realised that he was going in the wrong direction and had somehow got turned around, for the road should be behind him, not in front. And he hurriedly took another narrow glade that lost itself in greenness to the right. "'That's my direction, of course,' he said. "'The trees has mixed me up a bit, it seems.' then found himself abruptly by the gate he had first climbed over. He had merely made a circle. Surprise became almost discomfiture then, and a man, dressed like a gamekeeper in brownie green, leaned against the gate, hitting his legs with a switch. "'I'm making for Mr Lumley's farm,' 
explained the walker. This is his wood, I believe. Then stopped dead, because it was no man at all, but merely an effect of light and shade and foliage. He stepped back to reconstruct the singular illusion, but the wind shook the branches roughly here on the edge of the wood, and the foliage refused to reconstruct the figure. The leaves all rustled strangely. And just then, the sun went behind a cloud, making the whole wood look otherwise. Yet how the mind could be thus doubly deceived was indeed remarkable, for it almost seemed to him the man had answered, spoken. Or was this the shuffling noise the branches made, and had pointed with his switch to the notice board upon the nearest tree? The words rang on in his head, but of course he had imagined them. No, it's not his wood, it's ours. And some village wit, moreover, had changed the lettering on the weather-beaten board, for it read quite plainly, Trespassers will be persecuted. And while the astonished clerk read the words and chuckled, he said to himself, thinking what a tale he'd have to tell his wife and children later, The blooming wood has tried to chuck me out, but I'll go in again. Why, it's only a matter of square acre at most. I'm bound to reach the fields on the other side if I keep straight on. He remembered his position in the office. He had a certain dignity to maintain. The cloud passed from below the sun, and light splashed suddenly in all manner of unlikely places. The man went straight on. He felt a touch of puzzling confusion somewhere. This way the copse had a shifting from sorry, this way the copse had of shifting from sunshine into shadow, doubtless troubled sight a little. To his relief, at last, a new glade opened through the trees and disclosed the fields with a glimpse of the red house in the distance at the far end. But a little wicket gate that stood across the path had first to be climbed, and as he scrambled heavily over, for it would not open, he got the astonishing feeling that it slid off sideways beneath his weight and towards the wood. Like moving a staircase of Harrods in Earl's Court, it began to glide off with him, so I like the moving staircases at Harrods and Earl's Court. It began to glide off with him. It was quite horrible. He made a violent effort to get down before it carried him into the trees, but his feet became entangled with the bars and umbrella so that he fell heavily upon the other farther side, arms spread across the grass and nettles, boots clutched between the first and second bars. He lay there a moment like a man crucified upside down, and while he struggled to get disentangled, feet, bars and umbrella formed a regular net, he saw the little man in brownie-green go past him with extreme rapidity through the wood. The man was laughing. He passed across the glade some fifty yards away, and he was not alone this time. A companion like himself went with him. The clerk, now upon his feet again, watched them disappear into the gloom of green beyond. "'They're tramps, not gamekeepers,' he said to himself half mortified, half angry. But his heart was thumping dreadfully, and he dared not utter all his thought. He examined the wicket gate, convinced it was a trick gate somehow, then went hurriedly on again, disturbed beyond belief to see that the glade no longer opened into fields, but curved away to the right. What in the world had happened to him? His sight was so utterly at fault, Again the sun flamed out abruptly and lit the floor of the wood with pools of silver, and at the same moment a violent gust of wind passed shouting overhead. Drops fell, clattering everywhere upon the leaves, making a sharp pattering of many footsteps. The whole copse shuddered and went moving. "'Rain, by George!' thought the clerk, and feeling for his umbrella, discovered he had lost it. He turned back to the gate, and found it lying on the farther side. To his amazement, he saw the fields at the far end of the glade, the red house, too, a shine in the sunset. He laughed, then, for, of course, in his struggle with the gate he had somehow got turned round, had fallen back instead of forwards. Climbing over, this time quite easily, he retraced his steps. The silver band, he saw, had been torn from the umbrella. No doubt his foot, a nail, or something had caught it, caught in it, and ripped it off. The clerk began to run. He felt extraordinarily dismayed. 
But while he ran, the entire wood ran with him, round him, to and fro, trees shifting like living things, leaves folding and unfolding, trunks darting backwards and forwards, and branches disclosing enormous empty spaces, then closing up again before he could look into them. There were footsteps everywhere, and laughing, crying voices, and crowds of figures gathering just behind his back, till the glade he knew was thick with moving life. The wind in his ears, of course, produced the voices and the laughter, while sun and clouds, plunging the copse alternately in shadow and bright, dazzling light, created the figures. But he did not like it, and went as fast as ever his sturdy legs could take him. He was frightened now. This was no story for his wife and children. He ran like the wind, but his feet made no sound upon the soft, mossy turf. Then... To his horror, he saw that the glade grew narrow. Nettles and weeds stood thick across it. It dwindled down to a tiny path, and twenty yards ahead it stopped, finally, and melting off among the trees. What the trick gate had failed to achieve, this twisting glade accomplished easily. Carried him in bodily among the dense and crowding trees. There was only one thing to do turn sharply and dash back again, run headlong into the life that followed at his back, followed so closely too that now it almost touched him, pushing him in. And with reckless courage this was what he did. It seemed a fearful thing to do. He turned with a sort of violent spring, head down and shoulders forward, hands stretched before his face. He made the plunge. Like a hunted creature, he charged full tilt the other way, meeting the wind now in his face. Good Lord! The glade behind him had closed up as well. There was no longer any path at all. Turning round and round like an animal at bay, he searched for an opening, a way of escape. Searched frantically, breathlessly, terrified now in his bones. But foliage surrounded him. Branches blocked the way. The trees stood close and still, unshaken by a breath of wind. The sun dipped that moment behind a great black cloud. The entire wood turned dark and silent. It watched him. Perhaps it was this final touch of sudden blackness that made him act so foolishly, as though he had really lost his head. At any rate, without pausing to think, he dashed headlong in amongst the trees again. There was a sensation of being stiflingly surrounded and entangled, and that he must break out at all costs, out and away into the open of the blessed fields and air. He did this ill-considered thing, and apparently charged straight into an oak that deliberately moved into his path to stop him. He saw it shift across a good full yard, and being a measuring man, accustomed to theodolite and chain, he ought to know. He fell saw stars, and felt a thousand tiny fingers tugging and pulling at his hands and neck and ankles. The stinging nettles, no doubt, were responsible for this. He thought of it later. At the moment, it felt diabolically calculated. But another remarkable illusion was not so easily explained. For all in a moment, it seemed, the entire wood went sliding past him with a thick, deep rustling of leaves and laughter, myriad footsteps, and tiny little active, energetic shapes. Two men in brownie green gave him a mighty hoist, and he opened his eyes to find himself lying in the meadow beside the stile where first his incredible adventure had begun. The wood stood in its usual place, and stared down upon him in the sunlight. There was the red house in the distance as before. Above him grinned the weather-beaten notice board. Notice board. Trespassers will be prosecuted. Dishevelled in mind and body, and a good deal shaken in his official soul, the clerk walked slowly across the fields. But on the way he glanced once more at the postcard of instructions, and saw with dull amazement that the inked-out sentence was quite legible after all beneath the scratches made across it. There is a shortcut through the wood, the wood I want cut down, if you care to take it. Only care was so badly written it looked more like another word. The sea 
was uncommonly like D. That's the copse that spoils my view of the downs, you see, his client explained to him later, pointing across the fields, and referring to the ordnance map beside him. I want it cut down and a path made, so and so. His finger indicated direction on the map. The fairy woods, it's still called, and it's far older than this house. Come now, if you're ready, Mr. Thomas, we might go out and have a look at it. The end. Thank you for listening. Short, to the point, spooky woods, don't go cutting them down. They will find you, and they will, you know, not fully enact revenge, but then they know what you want to do, and they won't make it easy for you. And, yeah, I, I like that one. It's, it, yeah, kind of in contrast to the previous one. It, it explains a bit, perhaps a little bit more than necessary, but it's it doesn't, it doesn't labour anything. It doesn't, like... Oh, yes, fairy woods, never trust a fairy. No, don't, you know, again, don't don't go chopping down their trees. Certainly don't be, frankly, a rich Tory who wants to go and chop down the trees for a better view from his kitchen. I'm, I'm get speculating, probably right. Trespassers will be persecuted. I think if I put that on my front door, it keep away the Jehovah's Witnesses. No, it's catnip. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah. Don't have, I guess, too much to say about that one. I, I mean, I, I like. There's like, there's like some little touches in there that I like. How it's stormy outside of the fairy woods. And then as soon as he goes into it, it stops. It's it, it describes it as just like, you know, ev um, yeah. The moment he passed among the trees, the wind ceased shouting, and a stillness dropped upon the world. Uh, so dense was the growth that the sunshine only came in came through in isolated patches, the air was close. I, I I, feel like, ordinarily, in these kinds of stories, when dealing with something spooky and supernatural, you know, that and yes, it does get windier and more wild as it goes on, but I like that um, that's what happens when you wander into the Feywild. Right. Obviously, I don't know that, but I will defer to your superior knowledge. Um, yeah, I, I like that it goes from windy and blustery to calm and that yeah that that feels like a i guess an inversion of what i would probably not maybe not necessarily a trope at the time but certainly now of like ooh something spooky and weird is happening let's get weathery um and yeah i i like that as a as a bit of atmosphere um and yeah it's again this 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 feels more like your your classic blackwood You've got just spooky supernatural stuff that's not... It's quiet. It's too quiet, yeah. Spooky supernatural things that aren't like, you know, there's there's a dead man in the house or we, we said too much Latin and now the demons are upset at us. Um, it's, it's more, yeah, sort of folky, like, yeah, sort of folk horror... Um, that kind of jazz. So yeah, it's cool. I like that one. And I think that's from the uh, Ten Minute Stories one, which I I will probably try to revisit during book week. <laughs> we said too much Latin now. Demons are upset at us, right? But like that's that's M R James's whole bit. And I'm not I'm not knocking M R James. He wrote some very good stories, but that is pretty much every story. <laughs> he quotes in here. No, you see, it's like we 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 have quotes. They're entire books. Um, it's I don't know. There's I, we 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 could we could do quotes. I guess we didn't really consider them necessary because we weren't planning to do too much talking around the stuff we were reading, and then past that point, you were just taking bits from a book. But I almost want I'd almost like actually like we have quotes, but they're not things that Lucy or I have said. They're like stuff from books. So you know just. Aha, I want a quote. I want to see something funny. And you maybe you might get like a Mark Twain quote. Um, we could do that. That might be fun. But now we're a couple of years into this. Um, it might be weird. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, I'm going to go. It is... It, as is apparently my way now, I promise a short stream. And then we go on for longer than we usually, usually broadcast. So that's cool. Um... Is there anywhere? 
that we could raid. Do we want to go see... We, we could go... We could go see a blue skittle. Uh, the blue skittle. You could go see them. They're doing some artwork. Um, go say hi. Lovely chill channel. Um, I, I will... I will often find myself just lurking over there really just listening and watching um, they they do very good paintings of like fantasy fantasy sort of environments with cats in them um, which I, I feel probably has just piqued the interest of at least one or two people here in the audience um, so yeah let's, let's get a raid going to there I will need to remind myself exactly how the name is spelt a blue skittle B L U, right. Yeah, raided raided over there once or twice before I think, so it should know who we are, and yeah, it'll be it'd be a nice time. Right, that's the raid ready. Thank you all for being here. Lucy gets back uh after the weekend, I think. I don't know if she's able to read next I mean she'll yeah, she's not gonna lose the capacity to read, but she may not be reading on stream next Wednesday, I don't know. Um, I'm not entirely... I, th I think she might be around on Wednesday. I think she might be planning to. But I don't know. We'll find out. We'll put it on the Discord. Um, and in theory, I guess I should be back next Saturday. Uh, unless something truly awful happens on Thursday. But um, we need Lucy and Sammy modes. I guess we, we, we do, maybe. I guess. Maybe. Maybe we do. I don't know. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you all for being here. I hope you've enjoyed the stories you have heard and had yourselves a good evening for me but maybe not for you i see the time is counting down so i'm gonna have to go thank you all take care be well enjoy the raid um and we'll see you on the discord in the next stream goodbye and good night